So in this third video, I want to consider some other questions and objections that Stoniker's theory faces. So we've seen his theory of assertion, and strictly speaking, what it is, it's a theory of what assertions tend to do. Now one particular question is, is this theory a, supposed to be a definition of what an assertion is? So last week we saw various definitions of what it might be to be asserting something. Does Stoniker think he's giving us another one of these theories? And so the answer to this question is no. Stoniker is actually not proposing this as a definition of assertion. Rather, it's meant to be a theory of how assertion tends to do whatever it is that it does do. So why doesn't he think it's a definition? Well, one reason, and this is sort of reminiscent of one of Williamson's arguments from last week, one reason is that he just doesn't think that it's only assertions that do this. So first of all, he thinks that there are other speech acts that can maybe do this. So he talks about the example of supposition. So imagine cases where we're not asserting things to be true, but we're rather, we're just sort of supposing them. We're imagining that they are true and maybe drawing out their implications. One thing he wants to say is that in, in a situation like that, the update effect, the effect on the common ground, seems to be the same as that for assertion. Because if we're supposing something to be true, what it seems like we're doing is we're at least temporarily coming to presuppose that. We're all presupposing it. We're all adding it to the common ground. That's what happens when we suppose something to be true. But Stoniker thinks it's not like we want to say that assertion and supposition are the same thing. So this can't be a definition of, of assertion. Rather, it's just a theory of something that assertion does. Other speech acts is a particular example, but we might think, well, a similar point could be made by appealing to other things beyond speech. Because sometimes we'll want to add things to the common ground, but we do so in other ways that don't have anything to do with speech. So a particular example might be like pointing at something. Like if there's something happening over there and I want you to know about it, I could just point at it. If I do that, then it will become common ground that whatever is happening over there is happening. It's not entirely obvious that we want to call that assertion. Maybe it's something else. And there's no real there's no real need to sort of prejudge the question one way or the other. So it seems like rather than trying to settle the nitty-gritty question of is pointing an assertion in that case, we can just take the position that, well, this is just a theory of what assertion tends to do, and maybe other things do it too. Another kind of example in this vein is like, suppose I want you suppose you asked me an answer to something, you know, uh, was Oswald near JFK on the day JFK was assassinated, and I show you a photo of Oswald in the location. That's going to add to the common ground the fact that Oswald was in the vicinity of JFK when he was assassinated. So it's going to have the same effect as me saying that Oswald was there, um, supposing you take me to be trustworthy. Do you want to say that me showing you the photo is the same thing? As a, is that an assertion? Not obviously yes, and we also it's just maybe doesn't seem like a question that's really worth getting into. So the safer thing is just to say, again, this is just an effect of an assertion. That's what we're theorizing about. The last reason he has is somewhat more subtle, and it's that he ultimately thinks that even if these other considerations didn't work, this actually couldn't be a non-circular definition of assertion, because some of the terms that we analyzed the effect of an assertion actually appealed to the idea of an assertion itself. What we said was an assertion is a proposal to update the common ground in a certain way, and that's what happens if it gets accepted, and what's what, and it, but it doesn't happen if it gets rejected. But notice there we use the terms like accept, or accept an assertion, or reject an assertion. Stolniker basically thinks, well, if you try to give an ad, so really to give a full definition of assertion, you would have to in turn define what it means to accept an assertion or what it means to reject an assertion. And he just doesn't think it's likely that there's a non-circular explanation of that. So this would only be a definition of assertion if we could explain in independent terms what it was to accept an assertion or to reject an assertion. And he thinks that probably just isn't possible. So that's another kind of more theoretical reason for why he doesn't want to define assertion in this way. He merely wants to say that the theory we've given is a theory of the effects of assertion. So that's our that's the main kind of question about the theory. And now I'm just going to mention two potential counterexamples. So here's a kind of counterexample that Stoniker talks about in the assertion paper. 
he doesn't use exactly this example. This is a sadly more modern example, but it gives you the flavor. So imagine I say to somebody who I know is a flat earther, I say, the world is round. In that situation, I fully, I'm, I have full knowledge that what I'm saying is not going to become common ground. I know that my assertion is not going to become generally presupposed. You might think, well, isn't this a counterexample to Stonecker's theory? Because what we're supposed to be trying to do when we make assertions is we're supposed to be trying to update the common ground. Clearly, I can't be doing that in this situation because I know I'm going to fail. I know you're not going to accept. I know you, the flat earther, is not going to accept that the world is round because I know you don't believe that. You believe that it's flat and nobody could talk you out of it. So isn't this a problem for Stonecker's theory? Doesn't, give, doesn't it just give the wrong results here? And the answer is actually no. This isn't a counterexample to Stonecker's theory. Because in Stonecker's theory, an assertion is a proposal to update the common ground in a certain way. It's a proposal to make something commonly presupposed. It's a proposal to make it presupposed by everybody. And he observes, we can make proposals even in the full knowledge that those proposals will fall flat. So a simple example might be, you know, I can make a proposal that we all go on a picnic somewhere, even if I know everyone is going to hate that suggestion, everybody's going to reject it. They, I may or may not have good reasons for making that proposal, but I, I can make that proposal, even if I know it's going to fail. Another kind of example he talks about is proposing a bill in Congress. People can propose a bill in Congress, even if they're, they have the full knowledge that, that it's going to fail. So in general, it's not a property of proposals that in order to make a proposal, you have to think there's some chance it might go through. It's perfectly intelligible that there are cases where you make a proposal even though you know it's going to fail. Now there's a further question of which, in which cases that's going to be more or less rational. And it depends a lot on the details of the case, whether it's rational for me to pay, make a proposal even if I know it's going to fail. But the same thing goes for our original case. We have to fill in the details of my conversation with the flat earther to see is it rational or not for me to make to make the assertion given that I know they're flat earther. The last worry you might have about the theory is about this first rule we talked about. So we talked a lot about the third rule, uniformity, but we talked only briefly about this other rule which says that your assertions have to be informative, that whatever proposition you assert it has to be true in some worlds and false in others. And you might just worry whether that really is something that's borne out in actual conversation. Is it really the case that we only say things that are informative, or that it's only appropriate for us to say things that are informative? And this is where the Abbott paper comes in, because this is exactly the objection she makes in the final section of that paper. And what she wants to observe is that actually it seems like it's really, really easy to think of cases where we say things in the full knowledge that they're not informative, in the full knowledge that everybody in the conversation is already aware of them. So one example is just like small talk. So example, suppose I say to you, oh, beautiful day, isn't it? When we're both outside. If I say beautiful day, meaning it is a beautiful day, then I'm not saying anything informative. We already presuppose that it's true because we can see what's going on. But nonetheless, it doesn't look like there's anything wrong with me saying it. So Abbott's question is, well, what's going on in that situation? There are a few other kind of cases. So one other kind of case she talks about is, imagine you're at a colloquium talk. Whenever somebody is introducing a colloquium speaker, the first thing they say is who the speaker is. They'll say something like, tonight's speaker is Noam Chomsky. But of course, in most situations, it's kind of needless to say who the speaker is. People wouldn't be there in the first place if they didn't know it was Noam Chomsky. That's exactly why they're there. So you might think that in such situations, the assertion just isn't informative. But it doesn't seem to be anything wrong in introducing a speaker. In fact, there it looks required. You have to say who the speaker is before you, yeah, before you, you let them go and give their talk. A last case that she thinks about is a case of reminders. So suppose they say, don't forget you have that dentist appointment tomorrow. Again, this is a situation where it's not like I'm telling you anything new. I haven't informed you that you're having a dentist appointment tomorrow. That's not what the point of a reminder is. The very point of a reminder is that the information is information you already had. Rather, it's just sort of 
directing your attention to it. But reminders seem to be very useful things. It doesn't seem like we shouldn't be able to remind, you know, it, it would be bad if we weren't able to remind people of things. And Abbott's worry is, can Stonecker's theory account for this? So the basic worry is that Stonecker's theory seems to say that you can only assert things if they're informative, but we can think of various different kinds of examples where we do assert things, even though in some sense they're not informative. And in particular, they're not informative in the sense that Stalnaker laid out, where the proposition is true in some worlds, compatible with what we presuppose, but false in others. In all of those situations that we just saw, the proposition that I've asserted is true throughout the context set. So the question Abbott poses is, well, when we assert those propositions, we seem to be doing something important. How can the Stalnaker theory account for that? Stalnaker does have answers to this. It's something that he's discussed in later work. And we're going to talk about it on Wednesday in class, but I want you to think about this question for yourselves first. So here we saw a particular objection. How do we make sense of uninformative assertions? I want you guys for yourselves to think, well, what could, what could Stalnaker say is going on in these various situations?